Hi, I'm Aaron Brand. I'm Citera's uh, CTO. And with me is uh, Simon Michelson, our VP of Alliances. And today I want to talk to you about a pressing issue that is uh, affecting businesses worldwide. Uh, the, in the current uh, cyber landscape, uh, ransomware is extremely problematic, as you know. Too many organizations are being crippled by uh, ransomware, and we decided that we really need to do something about it. This is why we are harnessing the power of artificial intelligence in order to, develop, to deliver a more uh, intelligent cyber resilient storage. And this is, will be the topic of this uh, presentation. Okay, so um, let's start with the real life scenario. Uh, let's talk about a customer. So we have a customer from the manufacturing uh, industry with, that has about 150 remote slide, sites. And before they uh, uh, came to Citera, they experienced unfortunately a very large uh, ransomware attack that crippled uh, all of their production sites. Uh, they were completely down. And this was a very devastating attack for the company. So that is why they decided uh, they, to approach Citera. And uh, we were able to provide them uh, an, a resilient uh, storage solution that provides uh, a remote uh, storage uh, uh, in the cloud. The authoritative copy of the data uh, is now in the cloud. They have about one petabyte of files across uh, with the, their 150 sites, all consolidated into a single global file system. Uh, and, and the idea is to have uh, an air-gapped uh, solution where uh, an attacker in each of the remote sites is not able to corrupt any of the data or to delete any of the data and uh, to provide the ability to, to recover the data very quickly in case of a ransomware attack. So uh, I will talk a, a bit uh, later in this presentation about our capabilities for uh, rapid uh, ransomware recovery, for uh, automatic uh, detection, and for uh, uh, business continuity based on our technology. Uh, so the customer installed uh, about uh, 150 edge filers, installed on HP hardware, uh, HP are our, our partner in this product. Uh, everything is installed on uh, VMware. And the cloud is uh, AWS, with S3 being the storage backend in multiple uh, different uh, regions and locations using our uh, intelligent storage routing technology in order to route specific portions of the data to be stored in different uh, storage classes like standard uh, S3 or any frequent access uh, and between the different regions. So I think this like captures a lot of the questions we've we've covered, right, with respect to data, how it gets routed into, in this case, different uh, classes of storage, right, to save costs, leveraging and frequent access for archive and standard for more high performance workload. Um, not sure why it's uh, advancing. All these. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think I can I can advance. I can advance. But it also. Um, it also shows, and just uh, just to complete that thought, Aaron, uh, is that we can also leverage both virtual and physical appliances at the edge, all connected through single global file system to, in this case, Amazon, but it could be any cloud, right? So, um, so where's the global file system, resides. I don't know what you're called, endpoint actually running? Is it running in AWS one region or is it running across regions? I mean, right. how resilient is the, the global file system itself, the right. code, the software-defined storage, whatever you want to call it. So it's a great question. I know it's oversimplified here. It's just one logo, but it's a, it's a cluster of virtual appliances, and it could either be deployed on-prem on any hypervisor, such as VMware, Hyper-V, or uh, um, uh, KVM, but also in the cloud we support. We have AMIs to run these on Amazon, uh, images for Azure, and we typically deploy these across different regions different availability zone, zones, and have built-in HA. So if any component fails, we have its redundant system, right, running in a nearby region. Okay, um, where's this secure portal running? And that, so that is the portal. So we use that synonymously. The portal is what we describe. So the storage the nodes portal. and the portal are running concurrently on the same node. I'm sorry, the? The secure portal and the storage endpoint is running on the same nodes across the cluster. Yes, exactly. So the global file system and the portal is effectively that same component. And where's the metadata? Is the, is on the portal. The, the portal is that global catalog and the metadata gets replicated between the portal servers. Yeah, it's a little confusing because you know, portal is an access for an user to manage and a catalog is the data underneath it usually. 
Um, I do have a question, though. So is your, is your software um, uh, able to be deployed via container? Um, so it, we're in that process, we're in that transition. Mm -hmm. A lot of the internal architecture is based on containers, but we don't offer a full EKS deployment today. Okay, it's still running as hosts, as, as the virtual appliances. So the virtual machine is the unit of measure? Okay. Is the unit of measure, and underneath that, there are containers. Okay. So with your example that you're showing here, so effectively you're presenting SMB or NFS out to whatever. But underneath of it, you've got S3 and like IA in the same, is it, so you have files just being distributed across all of those? Exactly. So we have mappings that say these shares are sent to the infrequent access bucket, where, whereas the other shares okay. get sent to the S3 standard. Simply because of um, a good chunk of this data of the petabyte, as you can imagine, is archived. And they were they wanting the benefit from the lower cost of infrequent access. And are, is there protections built into the software to prevent the things that make IA go sideways on you? You know, from doing that, say, you know, somebody going through and deleting something on day five. Uh, sure. So from immutability, uh, we do support Im leveraging immutable uh, objects. So you will not be able to do an out of band type of an attack to delete the data from the bucket. Right. And there's. Start hitting an infrequent access bucket with a lot of reads where you start deleting data rapidly, sure. you're going to find a whole lot of extra fees. And it sounds like, you know, the, whatever the cloud service is, is on the onus of the customer here, correct? The yeah. customer goes to AWS, Wasabi, whoever, that's up to third. They're responsible to pick up that bill at the end of the day. And to your point, actually, actually Aaron published a, a great blog post about this that we, um, for the same reasons you described, that there are hidden fees related to access. So depending on the type of data set, its characteristics, the access pattern, we would advise the type of class that's needed. Okay. Uh, now, there's a lot of optimization happening, as you can see here. As the data gets written, it's all fully deduplicated, encrypted, compressed, right? So the, the, we shrink the data. So the, Is that shrinking done at the client, or is that done at the storage? Between, between the storage and the object? So it's done first when the data lands on the edge. We have single instance store at the, on the cache itself. And as we send the data from the edge to the bucket, we do a more global block level deduplication. Uh, through that uh, portal, right, has a global catalog metadata of all the objects across the entire global file system. It's able to confirm and acknowledge what objects were already written to those buckets. Um, that means that in this case, the actual S3 objects don't have a one-to-one -one mapping to file type objects. Okay. That is correct. Okay. Yes. I want to make sure that was so. Yes. Something and comes into the S3 bucket itself until they have the Satera buffer and logically the associated keys. That is correct. Data is pretty much useless. Yes. So the metadata stored in Satera portal is really that authoritative copy, uh, the combination with that and the object payload. And that's how we also do versioning control, right? So versioning control is uh, done at the block at the object level uh, as new versions get created it's simply reference counter mappings between the metadata and the objects okay. you mentioned also the work from home uh, case uh, in in this specific case uh, the the edge should be still uh, uh, an appliance or uh, you have a client edge uh, in this case study specifically, um, it is uh, uh, a virtual but the, appliance. Yeah. But we do have a client, a software-based client that could be deployed into a Windows, okay. Linux, MacBook uh, system yeah. that could enable access to the to this same data set. Um, and that is our kind of remote work type of uh, um, use case. Good. So let's let's talk a bit uh, again about the ransomware. So. Um, uh, with ransomware, you know, perimeter security only gets you to a certain uh, distance. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, we, uh, perimeter security is often seen as a wall, but even the strongest walls can be undermined by a single uh, slacking guard, right? So uh, one out, uh, the analogy here is that one outdated machine on your network, and you often have thousands of machines on your network, uh, can can be run and uh, cannot run uh, or a machine that doesn't run endpoint protection or EDR is the weakest link and the attackers will find that link and they will use it in order to attack your your NAS or your storage uh, infrastructure. So it's uh, we believe that uh, zero trust approach is the right approach. We need to uh, assume that uh, all the devices or there are devices in your network that are compromised. And the storage needs to be self-defending and cyber-resilient and to be able to, to protect itself against uh, ransomware attacks. 
Um, a second um, mistake that uh, people are doing is to view, view their backup as their, their rescue net, right? And, uh, and, and, and the reality is that uh, in 90% of all ransomware attacks, the backups are, are targeted first. So uh, once, uh, once you jump, uh, you know there's no net there to save you. That's, that's the most frequent uh, uh, case because attackers know that uh, if you have a backup, you won't pay there. Um, so this, it's very risky to rely solely on, on, on backup solutions and particularly on uh, backup solutions that don't offer true immutable storage. So that is why we uh, developed uh, CTRA Ransom Protect. Uh, this is our new uh, capability that we uh, released this year. Uh, so Ransom Protect in, uh, includes a number of pillars, four pillars. The first is early detection. So we have an AI-based engine based on machine learning. Uh, it uh, doesn't rely on signatures like an antivirus of known, uh, known attack, right? The, the ransomware trends change very, very frequently, and it's uh, really impossible uh, to, to uh, with any level of accuracy to catch them based on signatures. Therefore, we have, we have uh, collected a large uh, data set of uh, ransomware attacks, a large data set uh, of events from uh, real uh, normal user activity. Uh, and based on these um, uh, millions and billions of events where we were able to train a model that is able to distinguish with very high levels of accuracy uh, between uh, activity behavior that uh, looks like ransomware and behavior that looks like what uh, normal users do. So this, this is the, the principle of the early detection. And uh, this works uh, extremely well uh, in detecting both known and unknown ransomware uh, attacks. The second uh, pillar here is continuous protection. So our solution is built under the assumption that the gold copy of the data is in the cloud and in, is specifically in immutable object storage. All, all the storage in our system and everything that we store in object storage is uh, by definition immutable. We use content addressable storage where all the chunks of the files are addressed by the hash of their content. Uh, and this means that uh, uh, if, a, if a chunk is modified uh, maliciously, it is in immediately evident that this has happened and uh, uh, it's easy, easy to find. And we, we utilize and we, uh, the uh, immutability capabilities of the different object storage vendors in order to, to protect and ensure that these, uh, the data is not modified in the cloud. Uh, the third pillar is mitigation. So once we, once we uh, detect a ransomware attack, we have a comprehensive incident management dashboard where you can see all the ongoing uh, cases of uh, suspected ransomware in, in your organization. Uh, and we uh, quarantine or isolate the user that is uh, uh, involved in this uh, anomalous behavior. We, we, we terminate their access uh, and, uh, and we, we block the attack. We, uh, typically this happens within up to 30 seconds uh, from the start of the attack. In that context, Finally, uh, just a quick question. Yeah. When you say stop the attack, what exactly are we talking about here? We're blocking access to that share? The user. Uh, we're locking down uh, the user? We're, we're, blocking, we're blocking the specific user okay. that is uh, and the specific uh, device that is performing the attack. Okay. So we, we're now blocking the share. We're allowing other users to continue to work. We're stopping access for the specific user that was detected to be infected with ransomware. Okay, perfect. Um, recovery, the final, the final pillar is recovery. So uh, um, since uh, we detect the, uh, the, the uh, we, we have about uh, 30 seconds delay uh, in order to detect the anomalous behavior, uh, there, is still, there are still some files that you need to roll back. Typically it's a very small amount, but it can be, uh, in, in some cases, it can be, uh, also a large file, it can be expensive to, to recover it from the cloud. Uh, therefore, we have uh, uh, powerful uh, recovery capabilities that allow near instant recovery of the data to previous versions from the cloud uh, repository. And we will show that uh, later in this presentation. Hi, Aaron. Um, uh, Mark, yeah. before this, so just a question. Um, going back to the previous slide, uh, you mentioned about the AI-based um, early detection, you know, no signatures being needed. Um, are you still using signatures as well? I just, I've 
reports have seen all these reports in the past where people have talked about you know the ability to fool some of these ai systems by working on you know encrypting files but then doing a lot of really good things that trigger a lot of brownie points with these systems and then carry on kind of piecemeal working through it whereas signatures also offer that secondary layer of defense i'm just wondering what you guys are doing there yeah we, we don't rely on signatures we we found that uh many of the ransomware solutions uh, use uh, techniques to evade uh, signature-based detection. Even the known, known ones, they use very common file extensions like doc and mp3, and uh, they do things that look like uh, normal activity. Um, therefore, we, we found this uh, very uh, uh, inaccurate, and uh, not to mention that uh, new ransomware uh, strands are coming out early uh, every day. Uh, there are even uh, ransomware as a service uh, dark web, uh, dark uh, net companies that uh, perform runs, uh, targeted ransomware attack on companies as a service, and they, they develop a ransomware strand specifically for this attack. Uh, so it's really not effective uh, to use signatures, and we're not using them at all. Okay, and um, just as a follow-on to that point, if that's okay, um, I saw in a previous slide where you've got you know various kind of uh, security partners that you work with. Um, have you guys got any integrations where you were talking about the user isolations? Have you got any integrations whereby if the AV product, again, a lot of these are using different AI generated sets yeah. there to determine device health. Have you got any integrations there to say, oh, this device is saying unhealthy, let's proactively prevent access to the share yeah. until it remediates? So I'd like to add, uh, first of all, that we have a built-in antivirus. Uh, in fact, we have a dual antivirus, both on the edge filer and on the portal side. Uh, this is because we are zero trust all the way and we don't trust the edge filers. Therefore, we uh, don't allow, the CTR portal doesn't allow ingesting uh, files that are detected as viruses, even if the edge filer allow them. Um, this, so this, uh, this um, uh, adding a bit about the signatures. So we do have this form of signatures, right? But not behavioral signatures. Uh, regarding your questions, uh, we, uh, as part of the solution, when we generate an incident, uh, we allow sending this to a security management solution uh, 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 through a, a number of uh, protocols like uh, syslog, uh, and you're able to create in your SIEM system rules. If you catch these events, you can uh, do a wider, a wider blocking, for example, blocking this user in Active Directory, rather than uh, only blocking their access to, uh, to this device. So, Definitely, and, uh, and our customers are using uh, these integrations in order to, uh, to perform stronger, stronger blocking uh, capabilities. Uh, we are also working with Veronis, another security company, as part of our connector architecture. Uh, Veronis uh, offers another layer of protection, and they have um, a, a lot of integrations uh, that uh, you can do through the system. Is there some sort uh, of so, a... Yeah. Is there some sort... Is there some sort of a, a learning mode that you turn on when you first install the solution so you're understanding what the normal file access looks like? Yeah, let me, let me go, uh, good question. Let me continue and you'll see it in the next slide. Um, so, um, so, uh, so we got the Grindstone Protect, as you see here, the, the, all the monitoring and the AI is running on the edge. So it doesn't require cloud access, even your, if your cloud access is down, the ransomware is detected. And the, the model is extremely lightweight. Uh, the reduction in performance is uh, minute uh, for, for users. So, uh, and enabling this feature is uh, just a single click. The configuration is very simple as I will just uh, show you in a moment. Um, now, um, before, before I go into the, showing you the uh, the features of Ransom Protect and what you can configure. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to, to say that uh, recently uh, a report was released by GigaOM in where we, we entered uh, immediately into the leadership, leadership position. Uh, and uh, they said that uh, not, we now have comprehensive coverage of ransomware protection, including both uh, all the pillars of immutability, mitigation, remediation, and proactive capabilities. Uh, so we're very, very happy about our position in the market following this, this report. Um, yeah, and um, I think uh, and next we will uh, move into a demo. So I will uh, uh, give the microphone to, uh, 
Simon, and he will show you the configuration, and uh, there you will see uh, the answer to the question that you just asked. Okay. Good. So, what we have here in this demonstration is is a live demo of our ransomware protection capability, and uh, what we are showing here in this case is um, a host, a user. Uh, who's trying to access a share, right? This share is mapped to a Satara Edge device that's enabled with this ransomware protection. Uh, we're simply browsing data set. You see this Z drive represents a headquarters directory, uh, and we can see different types of files and, and directories. And on the, on the left, we had a command line utility that's going to simulate a live ransomware attack. Now, we're going to shift over and kind of show you uh, the dashboard uh, and the incident manager uh, on our edge device. And you can see over here that you can, of course, enable, choose to enable or disable the capability, but then control whether it's going to enforce. So do you want to get notified or do you only want to, um, or do you also want to proceed to basically take action to block that user? Um, and then finally, there were some settings on what is the time window that we're inspecting, right? This is live inspection of, <laughs> of IO as it's happening. And based on that, we determine if it's legitimate or illegitimate access. Um, so as you can see right now, we're not reporting any ongoing incidents, but the service is active. It's continuously monitoring for that suspicious traffic. Stupid question. Is only globally or you can set a different uh, uh, setting for share? Uh, maybe a developer share, uh, you just want to audit, but don't uh, mitigate. Uh, so this is a good question. So as we've released this as kind of the MVP, it's system-wide, so it's looking at the entire volume, but the, the unit of measure right now is, is an instance of an edge device. So you can choose to enable this on one edge device versus another, uh, that type of control you do have. Yeah, and Simon, if, if I may add here, uh, we have the capability to exclude the specific users or groups from okay. the detection. And this is our solution for uh, excluding specific workloads that uh, may be uh, uh, are problematic. Great. So as you can see on the left, we've started a, a ransomware simulation. So that's going to actively encrypt the data on the right. So you can see it's starting and you can start seeing the files getting renamed uh, and their extension is dot ransom attack, right? So the data has been altered with programmatically by, by, uh, by an attacker. Um, so what you'll see happening in a minute is that the number of events has jumped for, uh, to a thousand events, right? So that's already showing you that there's a spike in, in traffic. Uh, but then we also block the user account. So we have a local group that's called blocked user. As soon as we identify any suspicious activity, we add that domain user from the, that's accessing to that group, and that's gonna terminate access only for that user account. So other users can still access the share, continue their IO, but we log that incident now you can reinstate access simply by removing that user from that local group. And then you can take a look at a details view that shows you here, here's the data set that we've identified that was impacted. And then you can proceed from here to recover, right? So we have that versioning control capability that allows you to restore back to a point in time. And I, um, I think, and then just, just to complete that thought, you can see that the access was blocked from a user standpoint um, and the script just kind of failed to access. Right, so this is uh, just to wrap it up. Sorry, um, no worries. Your question, um, and, and I think this was asked before, but I, I don't think I heard it answered. Yeah. So at that moment where you've identified a client that is going rogue, do you have the ability to notify not not just a, a user but other security functions within functions the within like, the like, organization? Like a, you know, a SIM sort tool, that sort of thing. Yes, 100%. So from a SIM standpoint, we do connect to Splunk and other uh, SIM, SIM solutions where we provide those incidents to them. Uh, you can also integrate that to ServiceNow, for example, as your incident manager. But then also we present those alerts in the dashboards and also we provide email notifications to any principal that you've defined that should receive these notifications. So these are email-based notifications, but uh, combine that with an incident Right. tool like ServiceNow uh, provides good coverage. So question for you, the mitigation technique that you're showing here, um, sound like they're dependent on Active Directory, right? Because you're using a group and you're blocking users using, uh, you know, essentially you're gonna add a user into the blocked users group, which is something that would happen in 
um, either a, a, the local machine or in. Um, so that is country. a local group. So that's a group that's within that. That's not a, a well-known security identifier from AD. It is that that local that local group only exists on that on instance of of the, the edge file. Device. Yes, okay. the cache device. Yeah. So, so I'm just I'm just you know because uh, mm -hmm. I'm familiar with a couple of different ransomware attacks. Unfortunately, haven't been uh, belonging to an organization that that, that uh, a couple of them that have been victims. Um, that some of these tools, the first thing they do before they start encrypting files is they, you know, they undermine the un the, the the security uh, infrastructure, and right. and and one of the first things they can they go after is the uh, the, the machine's local, um, you know, ability to to do things like you know maintain user security. Uh, so um, how vulnerable is the mitigation technique to something like that? Like if 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 the, if the ransomware came in and the first thing it went after was the you know. The, the host, the, the host keys, the host, uh, you know, local user database, and corrupting that and locking them out. Right. Um, would you, if, if you, if for some reason your application lost the ability to manipulate the user database, would that eliminate your ability to mitigate? So that would have to. So in that scenario, Satera, the, the instance of the edge device would also have to be compromised mm -hmm. in the sense that it cannot uh, add that user to the blocked user group. Uh, now. Let's say theoretically that could even happen. Uh, this is not the end all be all solution for ransomware. We do see this as another line of defense okay, uh, that we that we implement, but we also supplement this with uh, connections with solutions such as Veronis, for example, yep. uh, where they can also take action based on anomaly detection on mm -hmm. audit logs that we send to them to uh, disable access for that user. Yeah. Um, Allow, allow me to add that this, this is very unlikely because this device is a very hardened uh, appliance. It's not, a, it's not a Windows machine. It, uh, it's a very uh, tightly configured Linux machine where the user, users have no shell access. And uh, so it's, uh, it would, they would have to uh, come in through some vulnerability uh, uh, and not through something that is, is very uh, commonly. Uh, that, that, brings, zero day. that brings up a very good question then. Yes. Um, since you're built on Linux and you, you know, obviously I'm sure you use the libraries that are out there, mm -hmm. how often does your appliance go out there and update its own libraries based on, you know, uh, on vulnerability? New security yeah. vulnerabilities. So, so we are responsible for those uh, shipping of patches and vulnerabilities and, and fixing them. Uh, we have a bundle uh, that incorporates everything from kernel patches, use, uh, libraries, and, and of course our software code. Uh, everything gets shipped centrally from that portal. You can schedule those updates across uh, enterprise-wide. Uh, and then for the when Aaron mentioned, we also have a built-in malware protection so you can run McAfee, uh, other antivirus tools that they reach out to um, to download DAT files, right, from mm -hmm. from from an e-policy server or from the internet. Um, so that is kind of its own path of upgrades. Okay. okay. So piggybacking on, on Glenn's question just a little bit. So it, you're saying it's using local groups. Is there integration to IDPs? To, I mean, you're talking about a global file system. I don't want to create my users over and over and over again. Of course. So that local group was only created for the sake of of, of this ransomware capability. Okay. We're fully Active Directory connected uh, with and support forests. So we have an ability to discover all the trusted domains within the environment. So, okay. um, and we can leverage any domain uh, or global uh, group, um, and you can nest users and groups. So. Okay. Um, from a permissioning standpoint, it's it's like your traditional NAS system. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. so as the ransomware story goes today, the encryption of the data is the last thing that happens. What we see commonly now is the exfiltration happens. Is the AI doing anything to watch those pop shares? Seeing if the user starts slurping up all the data in a share to exfiltrate first. Or is it just the, the encryption portion that it's protecting against? That's a good question. Aaron, uh, would you like to take that? Yeah, so uh, the, this product is intended to block the, the encryption phase, so it doesn't uh, deal with the exfiltration. So that uh, we have the integrations with uh, other tools like Quran. So there's no specific DLP mechanism? Uh, so we have uh, connectivity to an ICAP solution on mm -hmm. the back end where we do continuous scanning of the entire global file system, leveraging a semantic, an ESET, any type of oh, DLP. Um, yes, yeah, so semantic, for example, also offers DLP scanning over, over ICAP, and that's what we typically leverage. Okay. Um, 
but yeah. yeah. Uh, there's also, okay. of course, uh, any solution that can do direct scanning for DLP. Uh, we had some instances of those scanning directly off of the SMB shares that Cetera is presenting. Is this, is this uh, agnostic across any connectivity? Because this endpoint is Windows, so let's say, you, and it's an SMB share. Yes. So if you have something like an NFS share to a Unix or... Uh, yes. Um, this capability is supported across all the protocols. Okay. Yep. Except how do you handle that for NFS 3 if you're not using per user or sign-in? For example, NFS3 is still using Sys. It's only in NFS version 4, okay. right, where you have uh, Kerberos and, and actual user identity that's yeah. blowing in the traffic. Yeah. Okay, just make it sure. Yeah. You know, um, I know you, your answer, uh, his question was that you don't do it now, but it would seem that it would seem a natural um, follow on from your current, your current uh, behavior based detection where you're seeing here's a user that has modified you know, that his modification pattern is very different than what it was before. You could do the exact same thing where you have a user that their read access is significantly different than before. I so uh, I, just yeah. hoping yeah, we, we'll something yeah. Coronas does that for them, right? Yeah. This is not uh, something that's the current part of the current solution, but uh, yet we're, we're looking into additional AI-based uh, protections for uh, additional kinds of... Uh, uh, attacks and um, you know not only ransomware but other other attacks. I think we we should continue. Uh, Simon, let's go to yeah. the next. Well, I've got uh, one concern. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your 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 detection and everything appears to be connected to an edge. So you're actually doing the detection at the edge filer. You're you're doing the, the shutdown at the edge filer. All that stuff is being done at the edge filer. Shouldn't the protection be associated with the data rather than the access point? So I'm, I'm, you know, so if I've got two edges going after the same data and I don't happen to misconfigure one of them, I could be very well screwed. Aaron, do you want to take that one? Uh, so uh, the attackers are typically an infected machine, right? So uh, we block the infected machine uh, and affect the infected user on this machine. And it, it might be the same user uh, working in, you know, the same account working in a different uh, place in the organization and, and uh, or, or uh, uh, other users, uh, we don't want to, to affect them. So, um, uh, you know, if you want to do something global, like uh, terminating, uh, uh, raising an, an alarm level at the organizational level, you can do that using our uh, SIM integration. But... Uh, the solution is designed currently to block the specific the device and user that were detected to be a malicious. Well, it's, it's, it's the immutable object storage in the back end, but the endpoints that were, are the ingress on the edge, and the, and the edge devices have a cache of the core right. data. So you would want to limit the ingress from the endpoints, stop the attack framework. And then. Uh, my concern is that if I've got let's say classified data sitting out there. I want the same protection provided to that classified data, regardless of where it comes from, well, let's regardless define, of the access. Let's, let's define the protection. The immutability is, it can't be erased and destroyed. Protection here is accessing in to further, uh, to further the ransom, you know, encrypt it, right? So how would but the guy, the you know, purpose of this solution is to prevent, prevent ransomware from, from corrupting your files and stopping them within up to 30 seconds. And assuming uh, this feature is enabled on all your edge filers and uh, it's just a single click to enable it, then uh, if an attacker comes from another edge filer, they will also be blocked within 30 seconds. And uh, you will be able to recover very quickly to, through the immutable uh, cloud storage. What would you envision as a better protection mechanism for the data? Well, I would like to see the AI protection happen at the core, you know, at the cluster which is where data is being accessed. It, it, all, the, all the edge filers are talking to, quote unquote, the cluster. It's the cluster where I'd like to see the, uh, the ransomware protection, the detection. Yeah, but, but uh, when you do it at the, at the core, it will happen. Uh, the, the protection will happen typically later because uh, it, takes, it takes a while for large files to synchronize to the core. Uh, yeah. And it's, uh, so it's much faster uh, to do it on the edge. Uh, and definitely we're considering additional uh, enhancement to this architecture and more protection. 
but uh, this, this has proven to be uh, a very quick blocking solution, uh, very efficient and uh, very reliable. Okay. Yeah. If I may, let's, let's continue because uh, we have a lot to cover. Um, so, uh, Simon, let's go back to the presentation. Okay. So, uh, we, so we are very excited about uh, the AI-based ransom protection. Uh, this is one of the you know, things I'm mo most excited about uh, in my career, and it just works uh, amazingly well. Um, um, but uh, still, uh, there, there are situations uh, where you need to uh, recover files, whether uh, due to a ransomware attack or a different attack or due to a natural disaster. disaster. So our solution uh, 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 includes uh, by uh, rapid recovery capabilities, and I'd like to explain a bit how they work. So um, uh, our edge devices are cache devices. So uh, during normal operation, uh, they appear as they uh, uh, as they appear here on the top right, uh, normal operation, you see, you can see that uh, there are folders, there are files, and some of the files are in the form of stub files, meaning these files were not uh, accessed there recently or they're not predicted to be accessed soon. And uh, so if you try to access these files, they will be downloaded from the cloud and provided to, to the user. Uh, so this is a normal operation. So the, the, the files that are typically needed in a specific location are are cached, the other files are not, and everything works normally. Uh, now, in case uh, you have a disaster, uh, you need to recover the files to a previous version. So uh, in a traditional uh, restore solution, you would have to initiate a restore. Uh, let's say that you have uh, uh, one, uh, 100 uh, terabytes of data that was damaged. You would need to download 100 terabytes of data to the edge location. And that, of course, can take uh, days, it could take weeks, uh, so it, it's um, very impractical uh, in order to provide a good uh, recovery time. And, and, it, and, um, and it's also not efficient because users don't really need to access all 100 terabytes of data uh, at this time. They, they really need to access the files that they're working on today. So the way this works is that uh, when we do a disaster recovery, all the files or all the metadata is re-downloaded. This can take uh, seconds, it could take uh, maybe minutes uh, if there, there are millions or billions of files. Uh, and all the files are converted into stubs. Uh, and, and the users, uh, uh, they can access their files once this metadata download is completed. So within seconds or minutes, they have access to their files uh, at a lower speed because the files are initially downloaded from the cloud, but they have access. And in the background, uh, we perform the regular recovery procedure where we uh, download the files that need to be uh, available on this device, and we uh, warm them up. Uh, so uh, within, uh, within a short amount of time, the, the device will be functional and working uh, as in, in a normal operation. Uh, what we've uh, done this year is uh, we, we ta we've taken this one step further, uh, and we eliminated the need to download the metadata before providing access. So this is what we call rapid recovery. And rapid recovery really works on the folder level. So you can have folders that are stops. Uh, and so in case of a disaster, uh, you can roll back the folder to a previous version in the cloud. And then on the device, it becomes a stub folder. Now, if uh, assuming that what you have 100 terabytes of data in that folder, uh, it's still immediate. The device within one operation it converts the uh, directory into a stub. And then when a user clicks on a directory that was not uh, frequent, uh, recently accessed, the, this, uh, the, the metadata of this directory is downloaded on demand. And the metadata meaning the list of files in this directory, and then the stubs are created in, on demand. Uh, as in the regular disaster recovery, a background process downloads all the metadata. So within, within a, a matter of seconds or, or minutes, all the metadata will be back and, and you will be uh, in the same uh, operation mode where all the directory listing operations are performed locally without going to the cloud. So with the rapid DR, that has a great benefit of uh, essentially turning the recovery time, when the recovery time is defined as users can see their files, uh, to zero. Uh, so this is something that completes our vision about ransomware. Now, together with the forensic files that we create uh, 
uh, as uh, Steinman shown in the demo, we create forensic uh, uh, logs showing the files that were changed by the user that was uh, uh, caught by the ransomware detection. Uh, you can uh, target these specific files or specific folders that were impacted, and you can roll them back in the cloud, and they're instantly available back, regardless of their size, right? Even if they're very, very large, you, they're uh, rolled back to their normal state immediately. Okay. And now uh, we'll, we'll go back to Simon. Simon will uh, demonstrate a rather rapid recovery feature and how we can recover uh, nearly instantly from a ransomware attack. What we're going to see in this demonstration is um, what we call rapid rapid DR. Now, um, as Aaron mentioned, it's it's about how long does it take to present the data back to the users, right? As soon as soon as possible. Now. Needless to say, our architectures, are, as they're deployed, they're highly available in nature. We have enough edge components deployed out there, so there's an uh, active, active-like experience for the user, right? When they have a map drive to a Z, uh, a Z drive, uh, if anything happens to the primary, it redirects them to the secondary. But what we're going to show here is a, uh, uh, an on-demand instantiation of a new Cetera instance, and then configuring it and just how long does that take, right? Uh, to, to, to have all that metadata accessible again to the user, right? So what we were showing here is a Z drive mapping to um, Edge Filer 1. So it's one instance of Cetera. As you can see, it holds about 10,000 files per folder. And previously we were showing about 250,000. Um, and over here, it's just business as, as usual. So all the data is fully hydrated on this instance. Uh, easily accessible by by this host. Um, what we're going to show next is an instance of Edge Filer number two, which is not configured. It's reset to its default settings. We're going to start a timer, and we're going to kick off a script that's going to basically provision this instance. It's going to configure anything from the security settings connected to the portal, connected to AD, apply all the policies, right? So this is our enrollment script, uh, and we use this every day in every project to deploy hundreds and thousands of these instances because we want to make sure that the configuration, configuration is consistent and it's done fast. So we don't have to spend a lot of man hours you know, building these systems. Um, so what we're gonna do next is simply browse to the same instance. We just completed running that script and you'll see that the system is fully configured. So it's connected, it's gonna start downloading all the metadata and you can see all the 260,000 files uh, appear as if they're accessible. So we're going to go back to Windows Explorer now, and we're going to open up um, uh, the Y drive, which is mapped to this new instance we've just configured. And you will see that we're populating through rapid, what we call rapid DR, the metadata as you're accessing the folders. So why is this really interesting is because you ha we have file systems under management with billions of files. And even pulling back all that metadata could take a few minutes or could take a little while, right? So, and you don't even want to wait for that. And why wait for everything when all you need is that finance folder, management folder, right? So we listen to what users are trying to do and we through that prioritize how metadata gets retrieved back, right? Does it work the same way on NFS and real operating system? Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> and real operating systems as well, yeah. Um, Right, so right because at the end of the day, our implementation is file. There's a, it's a file system in user space, right? So we get interse we intercept all these requests, right, okay. uh, for read, right, reading attributes, um, and through that we we run our, our optimization of how metadata gets presented. So when you yeah. when you provision the uh, second filer, it had a uh, description of what data directories errors, et cetera, et cetera, are available to it? Is that how it works? Yes, so in the global file system, you have essentially all the volumes, right? And then administrators can set up a policy, these volumes should be presented to this filer, whereas these volumes should be presented to that filer, or by default, everything gets presented everywhere. It's a full mesh. Um, so when you connect, you simply say, um, connect to this portal and subscribe to, these, to this data set. And by subscribing to that data set, uh, all that metadata gets downloaded. And that's driven by the Python script that you ran? To... Uh, the Python script was just simply uh, an SDK that we've built to invoke the different API extensions. Uh, so the Python script is simply just one line instruc instructions of connect to AD, connect to portal, define the syslog, 
Um, and typically customers would define that config in a key value type of format or a JSON, which will feed into that Python script. So that will be their template for provisioning. Um, yeah. So this is essentially, uh, we're using the DevOps approach. We have many customers that are embracing uh, the DevOps uh, philosophy. And we have uh, the ability to deploy everything through scripts, uh, either through Python or using our SDK or through Ansible. So, um, and because our customers are really at, uh, often at very large scales, we have customers with hundreds or thousands of sites, uh, and they're deploying new devices daily. Uh, and in case of a disaster, when, when you lose a site, you want to deploy the uh, device very quickly. And as you, as you saw in the demonstration, you can deploy a new device uh, in seconds using a script. I do. I have a question about uh, from the infrastructure perspective. So you got a lot of these, uh, you know, these edge filers out there, whether you know on devices or virtual machines, whatever. Um, and you're you're going back to a cloud object store. Um, are you able to take advantage of, of private connectivity to those clouds as opposed to the internet? Right, because obviously, if you're if you're pulling down a whole bunch of those files, even if it's over time, uh, 100 yes. terabytes coming over the internet could be pretty pricey. It's a bad idea, right? <laughs> so you can go over Direct Connect or Express Direct Connect, Connect Express right? Route. Right. And those so are you able to direct? It, it, and also, from a sovereignty perspective, make sure that sensitive data doesn't go over the wrong borders, etc. Yeah, uh, GDPR had Germany has that issue. Canada has that. So are you able to um, create that kind of determinism of path, determinism of of uh, you know for private interconnectivity as well? Yes, so it, it's in multiple levels. From a networking standpoint, leveraging things like VPC endpoints and, and just routing capabilities to, to get the, the user and administrative access going through the right channels. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we leverage internet uh, uh, because uh, it's kind of, a, perhaps it's faster than their MPLS links, for example. So, uh, but then finally, to your point with uh, uh, setting up those different buckets in different regions, right, to maintain compliance of how data is being stored, ac processed, and accessed. Um, you, you have full control to define that in the in our system. So, yeah. Uh, most of our, I'd say, enterprise organizations deploy this with either leveraging Direct Connect or Express Route. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. It brings up the question with respect to the economics of object access, stuff like that. I mean. If, if your file system is sitting on object store and it's edge cached and all that stuff, which is great. But if I'm going to access files that haven't been cached, I'm going to have uh, egress charge. Egress charge. And are they charged through Centera or are they charged directly to the cloud uh, account owner or how is this played out? So I would say 95% of our deployments are ones where the customer deploys our technology in their cloud. So it would be them, it would be their Amazon account, their, their VPCs, and they will see that bill for the egress charge. What we help them do is discover the data set and enumerate everything and show, showing them the access pattern so they size the cache appropriately for that site. So we have uh, a discovery tool that will show you graphically, here's how much was accessed in the last 60, 90, three months. Uh, and based on that, that's the metric we use to determine how much cash we need to allocate to have that optimal hit rate. At so, the edge. At the edge, yeah. yes. How do you actually distribute your data and how do you maintain consistency among the various different sites? Oh, so the, so the replication itself is asynchronous. As soon as data gets stored on an edge device, it enters what we call a dirty cache. It enters a queue where then it asynchronously gets replicated to the S3 bucket. The portal acts as that global catalog for metadata, and it's responsible for syndicating all those updates to the remaining sites. So the portal has, again, those cloud volumes, and it has all the edge devices connected to it, and it knows who needs to be notified for that event. Um, so for example, um, if you have two edge devices connected from here in New York uh, to the same portal, the portal will act as, as that mediator to send all that metadata to, to New York and, and back. How do you maintain consistency between the two? Yeah. It's what happens if people are modifying the same thing? Same thing. So uh, we have, uh, first of all, locking handled within a site. So if two users accessing over SMB, but across different sites, we have uh, versioning control. So we maintain all versions in the system and there's conflict resolution. So if you and I are editing the same file from different locations, we will note, we'll see that uh, there's a version conflict and maintain both files. And what is the consistency? Uh, the latency? Uh, yeah. 
Is it uh, so? Uh, uh, how how long will it take for uh, things to converge to be the same? Say, or, oh, and it, what would be the user interface? Oh, present would it be like a Dropbox? There are two copies of this file. It will be two copies of this file. This is what users will see. They will see another the same file in same location, just appended with a conflict and a timestamp okay. and the name of the editor. Uh, an email is, notification is going to be sent as well. Um, and from a from a speed standpoint, that happens just as soon as we identify that uh, conflict has occurred. So, um, so that would be the metadata collision. Metadata before, collision before the full file. So if we're both working exactly. on a one terabyte video file. When I see it save, it's going to say, okay, there's an update coming. That's the moment that the metadata update will get triggered. And that's when the conflict file will be created. Okay. Is the cache a write through cache or is it right behind? Uh, Aaron, do you want to take that? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, so when you, you write a file, it's written locally and then it's synchronized in the background. So uh, it's right behind. So there's really no um, okay. synchronization between the edge writing and the global global core until after the file is closed that is correct so the file is first closed and then it is replicated correct yes okay. yeah so so the system uh, I, I think we we should continue uh, yeah. so i'd like to talk about uh, another capability that we have added this year another very important capability which we call citera vault and uh, Citera Vault is our, our method, uh, what we call uh, for worm protection. So uh, you might be f familiar with worm protection with other uh, uh, um, uh, solutions like, uh, like NetApp. Uh, uh, so we now pro provide uh, worm protection as a native uh, capability of the platform. And, uh, and the nice thing about uh, Citera Vault is that, uh, I mean, we, we, we've recognized that there are many types of data that, that shouldn't change, right? There are, uh, let's say, for example, medical, medical imaging files, for example, uh, legal evidence. There are many types of files within a, a normal enterprise uh, that, should, that typically are, do not need to change. So uh, by uh, enabling uh, worm protection uh, on a directory level in a very easy way, uh, you're able to protect these files uh, uh, much in a much stronger way against ransomware. Um, this goes beyond beyond uh, uh, snapshot protection. So we we've always had sna uh, immutable snapshot, but now we have immutability for the, the data itself, for the files themselves, in the current version of the file system. Now this so this helps you both for security. Uh, so if there are files that shouldn't be changed, they can change. You're you have better protection and of course, for compliance. So there are many different regulations that require require worm uh, immutable storage, and we now are able to to provide this as part of the global file system. Now, um, uh, how how does this work? The Terra Vault. Uh, all you need to do this is this is uh, included with the product uh, and, and the ransom protect as well. By the way, uh, every customer that buys the product. Today, the buy pays based on capacity, and all the features are included. Um, so uh, all you need to do is to uh, create a, what we call a cloud folder, which is our name for a volume. Um, you mark it as worm, write once, read many. And you have a number of uh, controls here. The first is grace period, which uh, typically uh, could be uh, set to a number of uh, minutes. Uh, this is the time when files that you write into the global file system become immutable. Why is this needed? Uh, because there are many applications uh, that write temporary files or they do some initial things when they write the file and you want, uh, you want your file system to work uh, perfectly with all the applications. So you define a small grace period uh, uh, measured in minutes uh, until the file is frozen and becomes immutable forever. Uh, once the grace period has passed, uh, the file cannot be modified. Uh, even an administrator cannot modify the file, and it cannot be modified uh, on the edge location. It cannot be not modified on the cloud. With uh, block, the, any modifications are blocked completely. Now, there, the, now we have a second uh, control here that's called the retention period. The retention period uh, measures the amount of time the files are protected from deletion. Right, so uh, until the retention period, uh, typically 
Uh, you could set it to, according to your regulations or preferences, you can set it to uh, a year or seven years or 100 years. Uh, once the retention period is over, the file can be deleted uh, by regular uh, users. Uh, sometimes it's required to be deleted by regulations, so we provide uh, after the retention period has passed, the, the file can be deleted normally, but still it cannot be modified. Uh, and there are two retention modes. Uh, there is a, a compliance mode and enterprise mode. Compliance mode, uh, in compliance mode, uh, there's no way to override the, this retention period, meaning that even an administrator cannot delete the file uh, before the retention period is over. So if you have a, a certain regulation that requires that you do not delete files for seven years, you set it to compliance mode, and not even an administrator can delete this file. Uh, now, uh, if, if you uh, uh, have something that is not uh, uh, mandated by, by uh, uh, regulation, for example, you just prefer to protect the files for, from modification, you can set it to enterprise mode. In this case, uh, there is a way, if you accidentally, for example, wrote a large amount of files and you want to get rid of them, uh, we have a process where uh, these files can be de deleted through uh, a secure erase process. This is not a regular deletion, but uh, you have a special role in the system called the compliance officer. Only users in this role have access to this uh, secure erase capability. Uh, and then there is a process that involves providing the reason for the deletion. Uh, it involves another level of authentication to verify that you're not doing this uh, by mistake or you're not a malicious user. So there's another factor of authentication. Uh, and uh, the, then the uh, uh, security <laughs> process uh, deletes the, the files, removes them from the, uh, ret their retention and contains <coughs> uh, an, an immutable uh, audit log or immutable uh, uh, audit uh, report that shows exactly who has done this operation, when and what files were deleted. This, this report cannot be deleted. Uh, and I think uh, let's hand over to uh, Simon again and let's demonstrate CTR Vault, uh, another exciting feature that we've added this year. Two modes for maintaining retention. One that we call enterprise mode and the other one is called compliance mode. Um, what we're demonstrating here is creating volumes on Citera, right? So everything starts from creating volumes at the global file system and then extending presenting those out to the edge filers out there at the remote locations so what we're going to start doing first is set up a, a volume for enterprise mode we call it enterprise we're going to give it an owner and we're going to define the compliance settings for this folder next so you see that we have a little compliance tab and we can enable write once read many um, and we can define things like the grace period. So grace period again defines how long the system is going to wait until it's going to apply that retention setting for that file that gets written to this volume. Same thing we're going to do uh, is create a compliance folder. So that's the other mode where by even administrators of the system cannot delete the data once it enters retention. Um, Enterprise mode does have a, uh, an option for the compliance officer to delete the data with two-step verification. It's a specific, it's not a regular delete, it is a privileged delete. Um, and you can see here that we can set up the mode and then finally define the retention period, right? It could be in days, months, years um, as necessary. During that time, data cannot be deleted or modified or renamed. Um, and here we're showing the compliance officer role that you can you can see allow file folders permanent deletion, right? So that's checked automatically for this role by default, but you can you have control over that. Uh, who who is granted with this permission? Uh, what we're showing next is a host mapping to an edge device that is presenting these volumes, uh, and we're opening just a word processor. We're entering some files into this. Um, uh, sorry, entering some text to this file, and we're trying to do things like save or make changes and as you can see it doesn't let us do anything uh, we're only being allowed to save it as a new copy right we cannot alter the original copy um, going back we're now going to start try to demonstrate uh, rename so we're going to try to do rename for um, a file that's under uh, retention and we're going to get an error right so that's that's expected 
and next I believe is delete. Yes. So delete is enforced as well. So right, very kind of what you would expect, right, from a characteristics of a file that's under retention. And even moving is is disabled, right? So uh, this helps a lot of customers because right, they can define different retention settings. Uh, some of them just need to keep the data, but others are really interested in just keeping it for however long necessary, and then continue and deleting the data as soon as they can. Um, what we're showing next is if you were to access directly from the portal. Now the portal has a web application, so it's another capability or option for you to see the data outside of SMB, NFS, and S3, right? Um, there's a web-based application, same data set as before, and we're going to try to do those same operations, but directly from the global file system. And these are enforced as well. We cannot rename, delete, uh, and make any changes. Uh, you do have a, a special file details tab that shows you like more information about what is this file? Is it under compliance? Is it in enterprise mode? So does the console vault work with, yep. so you're supporting deduplication, so there are potentially blocks that are in compliance, blocks that are in enterprise, blocks that are in neither mode. How does something like that happen uh, if I want to delete them? I could delete the file that had the block originally, not out of the enterprise mode, but... Yes, so this whole retention settings are essentially managed by Cetera. And in this, in this instance, what we're seeing in this demo, it's fully managed by us. So it's the logical, it's the logical construct of a file. I understand, um, but it's at the metadata level. I mean, the blocks the that are level. spread across you know, a 50 or 100 different S3 buckets in various regions, various AZs. Yes. So we manage some that. Which are you know, associated with compliance files, some which are not. I mean. Yes. So we manage that as well. Aaron, do you want to take that? Yeah, so um, the, first of all, the blocks uh, in the object storage are never, never, can never be changed. They're uh, stored based on the hash. So modification of, the, of these uh, blocks are, are blocked and made impossible. Um, and, and, and if uh, somehow someone manages to modify a block in the object storage, it's immediately evident because uh, the block content doesn't match its hash. Uh, the, the, the place where immutability, so in, in, that, in that case, uh, there is no uh, challenge. The challenge is where with deletion, right? So uh, you, uh, uh, we want to prevent the user from deleting uh, blocks uh, that are, uh, belong to a worm uh, retention. Uh, the way this works today is that uh, you are expected uh, as, uh, as an administrator to define an object lock on the object storage uh, to enable the uh, native object lock capability of the uh, uh, object storage provider. And this provides uh, a level of protection. Uh, we are planning to add uh, additional uh, improvements uh, because we're, we're planning to, uh, to uh, have the uh, exact retention period that is configured on the file to take, uh, right, each file is mapped to blocks, but there can be multiple blocks that are uh, that are there can, there can be a block that is shared between multiple files because of the deduplication. So um, what we're planning to do is to have the maximum retention uh, automatically uh, propagated to a specific uh, a block in the object storage. Uh, to to so we will have a, a native integration with uh, the object lock capability. This is not ready today, but uh, but to, but today you can uh, define uh, our retention. As part of the object lock, uh, just it's not propagated from the policies that we have in the user interface. So we will manage that as part of us assigning those uh, the right retention at the objects, even in cases of deletion when uh, a file needs to be promoted from let's say one year to three years because it was deleted out of the one year uh, uh, volume, for example. Okay. Yeah, but uh, um, and another thing that we're going to add is. Um, uh, legal hold. This is something that's currently still uh, not released. Uh, legal holds are uh, the, uh, the ability to mark specific files uh, as immutable. So you can mark them as immutable, mark them uh, again as immutable. Uh, this is needed for, for protection in uh, certain uh, legal proceedings. Uh, you can define, take a folder, mark it as legal hold, and this, this folder be immediately becomes immutable until you uh, release the legal hold. 
So what we're going to show next is we're going to go ahead and try to delete a file and we're going to see that it's in the compliance folder and it was enforced. Next, we're going to try to do the same thing on the enterprise folder using that compliance officer role. Um, only this time to, to perform that action, I'm going to do that. Um, so next we're going to try to delete. Uh, and this is going to be the permanent delete workflow or the secure erase as Aaron was describing. This is a two-step verification process where that compliance officer has to enter a code that was sent to him in order to proceed with that deletion. So that would be the only way in that particular mode to enforce the deletion of data. Um, and it's going to be logged in the system uh, as its own separate action. And you can see it over here. Uh, permanent delete completed successfully for, for those two files. Okay, so that lets you kind of distinguish between a regular delete and something that was done by that compliance officer. Um, okay, so let's pull it all together. Um, Citera, uh, we, we've taken uh, cybersecurity very, very seriously. Uh, Citera was founded uh, with the idea of making uh, storage more secure and protecting against uh, ransomware attacks directly at the, at the edge uh, location or at the, at the place where users are accessing the files. Without, uh, uh, as another layer in addition to endpoint protection. So um, uh, this includes ransom protect, which is, uh, as we mentioned, the zero day AI based protection based on machine learning uh, that is built into the edge filer, uh, is activated when one click, doesn't require any additional license and has very low uh, performance overhead. Uh, the second feature that we talked about is the uh, Itera Vault. Uh, our worm capability that uh, allows the um, different uh, enterprise retention mode and compliance retention mode uh, the, for different uh, use cases. It's a great addition for protecting your files that are not expected to be modified against uh, ransomware uh, as another layer. And this makes, uh, I mean, files that should not be modified can be protected in an even stronger way, in addition to being able to meet uh, uh, all the regulations such as SOC, uh, GDPR, and so on that require uh, information to be stored in an immutable fashion. And finally, and let's not forget the rapid recovery capability uh, that allows you to uh, recover uh, any amount of data within uh, seconds or almost instantly uh, from uh, the cloud-based repository, even if you have uh, if lost a large amount of files. Uh, 